So you see your massive $118 billion purview out of Bentonville, but you're, you're clearly not from there. Correct. Um, but for a long time, you were working in Walmart's UK business, uh -huh. and you didn't really entertain conversations about moving to the US and taking on a larger role. Why, why was that? Um, I, uh, so I have a career which is started in finance and moved into operations in um, the Asda business back in the UK, and I was there for 17, 17 years, and I thought I had the best job in the world, and I was quite happy doing what I was doing. And this opportunity came up, and I'd kept saying I wasn't going to move. And I went home one night and talked to my um, talked to my husband and said, you know, there's this chance, one last go at this. It worked for how old the kids were, and we ended up packing up and moving to America. I intended to go for two years, and five years later, <laughs> we're all still there. My daughter's just started working in the U.S., and uh, my son's planning to go to college there. So sometimes these things are not planned and they, they work out. And I'm extraordinarily grateful for the way that it panned out in the end. So, so one of your first jobs, you came to the US, you were pretty immediately, I guess maybe a few years, and tapped to be the, the COO of Walmart US. And it was a ch pretty challenging time for the company. How did you even get your hands around what you needed to do? <laughs> So the, um, I started off in the international business. I did about a year there uh, running the strategy function, which was good practice for the job that I've got today. But I, um, I moved into the US business. We had a new CEO for the group business. The business um, was in need of revival, is the way that I'd put it, re-energizing, really. The scale of that business is extraordinary. It's 1.2 million people, um, 1.2 million associates, and 4,500 stores. And the biggest question is, where do you start when you're trying to do something like that? For me, it was actually the only thing to fall back on is how do you create trust? And we had processes to fix. We did investments in wages. We did investments in training. We did investments in processes and technology. But ultimately, if you can't get 1.2 million associates to believe that actually you have their best intentions and the customer's best intentions at heart, then you can't win that battle and you can't take people with you. So we set out very deliberately to listen. We went out on listening tours. We brought groups of our store management together. We walked stores. And you know what? Everybody actually told us not only what the problems were, but 90% of the time they told us what the solutions were as well. So how do you go about getting your arms around something like that? You have to do it one store at a time. And whatever business any of us are in. If you ever think of it at scale, then actually you, you kind of get slowed down by it. You've got to think of it in these manageable chunks whilst always respecting, in my case, that scale needs a different approach. Simplicity is the only thing that works when you're dealing with that kind of scale. And you've got a great phrase, TNTs. <laughs> yes. Tiny, tiny noticeable. Tiny noticeable things. So, it, go ahead. <laughs> So this came from the UK. So um, what makes a difference sometimes is not the really big things that you do. It's the TNTs, the tiny noticeable things. It's the note from somebody that says, you did a great job today. It's the, I gave you a call because I knew you got a promotion. And I just wanted to say to you, you've got this. It's the walking the store and taking the time to walk into the back, go and pull up a chair with the claims clerk, because nobody's ever walked back there before and say, tell me what's on your mind. They're the TNTs. And there are people here, Shelley Broad is here, who is fantastic at doing TNTs and just reaching out when it's most needed. And I just, every time I do anything, I, I do kind of groups of people. I, I encourage folks to do this, because it makes a huge difference. You know it does to you. You know those moments when somebody's reached out that has made a real difference to you. And actually, the more that we do that, the more we build trust. And actually, people just respond to it. And at the end of the day, all of these jobs are about people. Great. So let's, let's talk about your current role, which you took on in February. And you've been very busy. <laughs> you've, I mean, you've really sort of undertaken a massive transformation of the portfolio since then. Can you walk us through some of those moves? Yeah, so I started my role on the 4th of February, and by the beginning of May, we'd done three major, announced three major transactions within three weeks. We divested of 80% of our business in Brazil. 
we announced a merger in the UK with the number two, so we are the number three Asda um, supermarket, which is going through the competition. Which is where you got your start. Which is where I got my start. That's where I started. So quite an emotional transaction to talk about. And then thirdly, we announced the transaction in India to acquire 77% of Flipkart. So we did all three of those in a, actually announced them in a three week period, which I wouldn't recommend to people <laughs> um, as a way to start. But you know what's really interesting? When you do hit the ground like that, you actually don't have that much time to think. You get on with it, you bond with your team really quickly, and the team runs with you. And that actually, if I look back now, eight months in, um, it was, although I don't recommend it, for me, it actually worked pretty well. So we had those, um, those transactions happening. That had been part of the strategy building up to that. But it made us stand back and be much more thoughtful and deliberate about the portfolio. So one of the things that we've been doing is saying the world is changing and it's changing rapidly. Not only are customer expectations changing, but it's a more economically volatile environment and you have to focus where you can actually create the most value, both for associates, for the businesses. So we did a twin track of saying, we have to see these transactions through um, and we have to make sure that they're successful for the markets in which we operate. And we've still got stakes in all of those businesses, even the ones where we're divesting. Um, but at the same time, we have to relook at the international strategy as well. And we have to think about what does the future look like for an international business on an international stage? You know, it's a $118 billion business. It doesn't take care of itself, and you have to have a view of where you're getting to. I had this great phrase recently from um, Bob Johansson at the Institute of the Future, if anybody's ever done any of their programs, which is you can provide clarity, but you can't provide certainty. And that's what we've been trying to create, is some clarity about where we're getting to. So we've come up with this phrase, Beth, which is um, strong local businesses powered by Walmart. And everything we're trying to do is to say, how do we create strong local businesses? Because I think that's important for the future. But for those businesses, it has a benefit of having Walmart behind them, and that should create competitive advantage for them going forwards. And then we created this filter, which we call our promise, which is um, making life easier. How do we make life easier? And that applies for customers, it applies for us into the businesses that we operate, it applies to our partners, um, it applies to each other as we're doing transactions, as we're doing business, as we're creating systems. So one part of it as we came in was what are the deals that we've got on and how do we do those to the best of our ability? And then the second part is, how do we create a strategy that gives us some clarity about where we need to head in the future? Okay. Even though I don't think any of us can predict completely what's that going to look like. If people have got a purpose and they know where they're heading, um, then we'll all march in the same direction. So, so I want to stay on Flipkart for a second. As, as Lee said, biggest deal in Walmart's history, biggest pure e-commerce deal ever. Yeah. Why is India such a key market for you, and why has it historically been so hard to crack? Yeah, so we've been in India for um, 10 years now. People forget that part of it. We have a cash and carry business there. It's got 22 stores. Had we not got that business, we wouldn't have had the confidence to be able to operate in India and know that we can make a success of a business there. So that really helped us as we thought about this. But, you know, I think in this in three levels, you know, why India, why e-commerce, and why Flipkart? Um, why India? It's 1.3 billion people. It's got a fast-growing um, GDP. Right. It, it has got internet penetration that today is only at around about 2%, forecast to get somewhere nearer towards 12 by about 2027. 12 doesn't sound high, but then you remember it's 1.3 billion people. And then you remember like a small number times a big number is a very big number. And that she's got a background in finance. So <laughs> that sort of sets the framework for that. So India to us was really important. And one of our jobs in Walmart International for Walmart overall is to provide long term sustainable growth. And if that's what you are about, that's your role in life, then actually India is a market that we think is really important to operate in. So India was very clear. Why e-commerce? Well, the stats tell you it itself. India is a market, for those of you who know it, who appear to be generation skipping in a way that no other market, even China, has, has done. And you, I was there last week, 
Um, and you're, you're driving along. We went into some of the rural areas, and we're working with farmers there, um, and sort of how do we create sustainable farming and livelihoods for individual smallholders. But you're driving through um, part of um, a town called Lucknow, and there's a house which is um, being constructed. Um, there is a shelter with a cow standing underneath it, and there is a gentleman looking at the cow with a mobile phone. A and that's the kind of juxtaposition, really, that that market provides and the opportunity that e-commerce has got. There is um, a growing use of um, smartphones and smartphone penetration. It will be a long journey, but we think e-commerce is the place to be in that market. And why Flipkart? It's already an incredibly successful business. It's got momentum. It's got some winning positions in some key categories, like apparel and, and mobile phones, both of which are incredibly important in that market. And it's got a great team. And the foundation of that team and how strong they are is one of the things that really impressed us. Their cultural fit is great. And when we were there last week, some of the um, innovation they're doing is extraordinary. So on their app, you can go on their app, their Mintra app, which is their apparel app, and you can use augmented reality to measure your feet. Wow. It tells you the size of your foot. And by the way, it's accurate. I did it because I asked for a European sizing. And then that helps you order what size of shoes you want and by the way, it also minimizes returns because you've got the right size in the first place. It's those small, really clever innovations that we're going to learn a lot from that business from as well. It was really good. My feet didn't look good in augmented reality, I'll tell you that, but I, I would encourage you to try it. So, but this is a really different way of working for you. I mean, with Flipkart, you have a 77% stake. Um, you are now have a 20% stake in Brazil, 42 in the UK. A lot more partnerships. How has that changed how you, how you work? Yeah, so, so you take the Walmart of, of decades ago, um, we were much more comfortable being in control of everything. It's not the world today. We're, we're all going to learn how to partner more effectively and be better partners to each other where it makes sense. And there's this buy, build, and partner equation that we, we think through. Flipkart is one of those. One of our biggest challenges there is how do we encourage them to still have an entrepreneurial spirit? How do we keep that innovation pipeline going and still be part of Walmart? And that's something we're really focused on with the team there. We haven't changed any of their reporting structures. We haven't changed any of the way they operate. They still have a board and do that. We've got pure partnerships as well around the world. So Rakuten in uh, Japan is we have, it's one of the leading Japanese internet companies and um, it has a huge range of businesses. We partner with them in terms of how they um, pick from, we pick from stores, they deliver it for us. How do we make sure that we work for them? We're really easy to work with. We try to be progressive in the things that we're thinking about. So these partnerships, China's the same, JD, JD Dada, all partnerships we're creating. And I think you're going to see more of this, but not just from us. I think you're going to see more of this from everybody in business as well. And the power of people together can be much greater than the power of us individually in the right circumstances and in the right way. And the key part of it, and it's the theme you'll hear me coming back to in everything I talk about, is trust. How do you get partners you can trust that you can work with where you're commonly aligned with where you're trying to get to, and it's not, it's not naturally in our DNA, that's for sure, but we're learning, and I think we're getting better at each step of the way. Great, I'm gonna open it up to questions in one second, but first, when you were in the, UK, when you came to the US, you really applied a lot of the things you had learned in the UK, the UK grocery market it has been much more advanced on a lot of levels. Um, how are you making sure what's happening in these global markets is coming back and spreading around the world and coming to the US? The hardest thing in the world is to share global best practice. And if anybody's cracked it, let me know. I've seen um, platforms, portals, summits, everything. We've tried lots of different things. 
One of the best things to connect is actually getting out to markets and visiting and getting people to cross market, either from a global talent and mobility perspective or from a go visit, spend a bit of time, understand and see it. So we're doing more and more of that. And one of the, my personal missions in this is to connect the US business more to the international markets as well and use that as a source of leverage, not just international markets to international markets. So there's no um, magic wand on how to do it, but we're seeing some real successes. And probably the biggest area is when there's a pull from around the world, and the customer pull at the moment is omnichannel and online grocery. That is probably the biggest pull, and I'm seeing common wherever you are. So that's, um, that's one of the big areas of focus that we've got. Great. I think we've got a question right in the front. They told me I have to stand. Yes, please. <laughs> Hi, Jenny Johnson with Franklin Templeton. Just back on the India question. So one of the challenges in India is that so much of the population has to, the, their income is so small that they buy, for example, shampoo in daily packages right. and things. That to me is so fundamentally different from how Walmart sort of operates. How do you think about that yeah. in addressing that market? In fact, our cash and carry stores do exactly that. So the cash and carry stores primarily serve the Karanas. One of the things about Walmart is um, we operate in 67 different banners around the world. We're known in the US, if you're known as here, for big box super centers. That's not true everywhere. And around the world, we've got discount stores, we've got bodegas, which are kind of um, much more discount, for convenient, lower price for people. In India, the Best Buy stores, Best Price stores have got, um, not Best Buy, Best Buy aren't in India, by the way, just to <laughs> clear that up. And um, Best Price stores are cash and carry. And what they've done there is they've done um, partnerships with suppliers, the big suppliers, some of which um, are here. And we sell the individual sachets of shampoo in a roll of six or eight. And actually, we then say, that's what the Karanas buy from us as part of that cash and carry offer. If you've not seen it, it is extraordinarily extraordinary to see it. And people come to the Karana, which are anything from a small roadside shack to a little shop at the front of someone's home, family owned generally. Um, and they have these kind of packets hanging, tied shampoo, tied washing powder or shampoo or whatever that looks like. And that's what people can afford to buy. So we already appreciate that and see that. And undoubtedly, India is a developing market. There's a lot of growth still to come. But we actually think that Karanas are a key part of the strategy, either for us to serve them Oh, the other thing that was interesting when I was there last week, which was talking to some people about how do we encourage businesses to expand their small businesses. Um, Flipkart has a number of smallholder businesses on a marketplace. And one of the things that um, Bini Bansal, who's the founder, committed to in a meeting that we were there, is Uttar Pradesh, which is the largest province, or one of the largest states there, 220 million people in one state in India would be the fifth largest country in the world wow. if it was independent a country, is um, they have this um, one, one province, one product idea, which is everybody's famous for something. And Flipkart is saying, how can we get a producer of that one product onto their platform to help them grow? It's a fascinating part of how do you help the overall economy grow, not just our business, because for us to be successful, the economy's got to be successful and smallholders have got to be successful. It's a great question there. Great. I want to end just by asking you, you mentioned that your, your daughter <laughs> now works at Walmart. Yeah. She is an associate Valentine's candy buyer. She is. Uh, what? <laughs> it's a great, good, great place to start. Uh, what, is, what piece of advice do you give her? Um, I try to avoid giving her advice at all costs because she's like, oh, mom. Um, I wish, two things I wish in my younger self. One is I'd been more confident about the things that I could do. And the second is I'd learned faster that being myself was okay to be. And I think they're probably the two things that would tell her. I wouldn't dare give her business advice. I really hit the rocks on this, Beth, when she said to me, and my job is I'm the assistant Valentine's candy buyer. And I said, well, that's one day a year. So what are we going to do for the 364? Some, <sighs> to, some, which, uh, to, to give you an idea of my daughter, she just looked at me and said, um, I also help with Christmas and Easter. 
very critical role. Very critical. Judith, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.